Hello and welcome. This is Electricity and Magnetism Part 14. I'm going to talk about electromagnetic induction and Faraday's law today and Maxwell's equations. So let's start with um, electromagnetic induction. EM induction. How can you induce a current by playing with the electromagnetic field? So the idea is to attribute it to Faraday. Let's start with his experiments. So he thought about, okay, we this, uh, you can create a magnetic field using a current. Okay, and um, Ersted's and Ampere's experiments show that you can create magnetic fields using currents. Does it work the other way around? I mean, can I create currents using electromagnetic fields or magnetic fields, let's say? So the experiment, can we obtain a current? using magnetic field okay so how are we going to generate the magnetic field you can use a magnet that's one option a magnet and uh, for a current you need a wire so should i bring a magnet close to a wire you know he said maybe i should come up with something um more accurate you know and I need uh, many uh, loops in a side in a coil so that I can amplify the effects that I want to see so let me not use the magnet let me use a maybe a uh, current carrying wire uh, bent into a shape of a solenoid so that I can have a magnetic field through it okay so the field lines as you know go like this so the, the coil will be connected to a battery, maybe a resistor and a switch. And I want to generate a current somewhere else. Why don't I use another coil? Coils are handy. I can put a coil here, a secondary coil. And if I ever have a current here because of the magnetic field, I will be able to measure it by using a galvanometer or ammeter. Okay, that's the setup. Uh, in some versions, uh, for the continuity of the magnetic field lines, you'll see this picture here. A, uh, maybe a torus. And then you put the coil on one side. This will be your primary coil and the secondary coil will be wrapped around it. So this way the magnetic field you generate using the primary coil will travel through the uh, magnetic material. Okay, magnetic field lines are loops, remember? So that's an alternative setup. So these uh, red magnetic field lines are actually also loops as well. Okay, so Bottom line, he tried this. So he closed the switch. Now he has a current and a magnetic field, but nothing happens on the secondary coil. No current, except for the instant he turned on the circuit by closing the switch, he saw a spike, like a deflection, a sudden deflection in the needle of the uh, ammeter. But once you have a steady current and a steady magnetic field, no current okay and then he turned the switch off by opening it and then again he saw a deflection in the uh, ammeter so he quickly realized that it's not actually the magnetic field but what happens to the magnetic field in other words the change in the magnetic field causes a deflection in that ammeter therefore a current so that was his deduction e here 
occurs only when there's a change in B. You know, in mathematical language we're talking about it's time derivative. That's what we mean by change. So if this derivative is a non-zero number, B changes. That's when there's a current here realized. Um, actually, if you use a magnet instead of an electromagnet, which is the coil on the left, he would obtain a similar result if he moved the magnet towards the coil. Now that would effectively change the field strength near the uh, second coil, right? The second coil is our detector, you know, that will detect changes in the magnetic field. But when he was playing with this, he realized that he could keep the magnet the same position and coil here, but then rotate the coil and he would still observe some effects. He would see a current there. So it's not just the change in magnetic field. So what physical quantity do we have that represents a change in the angle besides magnetic field? It's the flux, right? So let's recall the definition of magnetic flux, phi b. You basically, you have an area doesn't have to be an ellipse, any area would work, and a magnetic field through it. You look at the uh, surface normal direction, and you can associate it with a differential area element, so you can call it dA, and take the dot product of B with a dA, and integrate over the surface, that's your flux. Okay, so the rotation means the angle between B, let's call it theta, B and DA changes. So B, DA, cosine theta. Anytime phi changes, you should expect a change in the flux as well. So he realized that it's actually the flux, not just magnetic field, but the flux that causes the uh, current in the second coil, okay? So changes in flux. We're talking about the derivative of the flux, which will create a current. That was a big discovery. So he just had to formulate it, like how to relate the two. Now every current is because of an EMF, he said. You remember that word, electromotive force. When we discussed uh, DC circuits and batteries, a battery is basically an EMF, right? A voltage source. So this quantity here is nothing but a voltage, it turns out. Um, so EMF E, is it equal to this? Well, there's a negative sign, it turns out. And I'm gonna explain what meaning it has, all right? So this is called Faraday's law. Faraday's law, and sometimes the negative sign itself it's called Lenz Law. Another physicist. So it basically tells you the direction of EMF. Now why do we need a direction for a voltage? I mean a voltage is a scalar, it's not a vector. But we need a direction because it has to do with the direction of the current. After all, current is not a vector either, but it's a direction, right? So EMF should uh, be related to which direction the uh, current flows. Rather than being positive or negative, you know, an arrow for the EMF will tell you exactly which direction the current will flow. So let's take this example here of uh, the loop. Suppose uh, the magnetic field here is going to change. 
Okay, let's not change the angle for now. So the change to the phi, to the uh, flux, will come from the change in B itself. B could be a function of time. Right? So you can plot B. It could increase and then decrease, you know. Uh, let's consider the case where it increases first. B increases in time. Now how will this affect uh, the EMF? And that's going to tell us what direction we're uh, talking about. Okay. So whether B increases or decreases, in this picture here, one thing is certain and that is the sign of phi. Phi is positive, right? I mean we have an angle here less than 90 degrees cosine that angle is a positive number and when you do your integral you'll end up with a positive number for sure so phi is positive but it's not really what we're after okay we don't look at the sign of phi alone we look at the change in the phi so if b increases so does phi if b increases phi will increase as well which means its time derivative will be a positive number okay this this shows the change but it increases and if it increases since the definition of the emf has a negative in front of it so negative times this means emf will be a negative number All right, EMF will be a negative number. What if uh, B was decreasing? Uh, if B is decreasing, let's use uh, white again. Phi is, of course, still positive. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in this quantity, d phi by dt. It is decreasing, okay? If B decreases, phi will um, decrease resulting in an emf which is a positive number okay so what about the direction then that i'm talking about direction of emf the right hand rule will be used again you put your thumb in the direction of your area vector da which is pointing up in this case and then these fingers when you curl like that if emf is positive that is the direction of emf if e is negative take the other direction so for this second part where b decreases we found a positive emf right so using the right hand rule we decide that this will be the direction of the EMF it's a positive number but it has to do with a decreasing magnetic field okay now the first case when B was increasing we found out that the EMF was a negative number so it has to be the other way around this would be the direction of EMF. In other words, that would be the direction of the electric current if this was a loop, right? So this is a negative EMF, and that's because B is increasing. Now, uh, magnetic field is something we can measure. It's magnitude and direction, and EMF the direction of EMF turns out to be the direction of the current, so that's something easy to measure as well. But there's something arbitrary here, and that was the choice of uh, DA. I mean, I said DA had to go up, but why? No, maybe DA is downward. It could be, right? So let's think about that now and see if that will have any effect on our consideration here so this is your loop again okay and uh, the magnetic field is still pointing this way but I'm gonna pick the uh, 
DA downward. So what changed? The angle between DA and B changed. It's something greater than uh, 90 degrees, right? This angle here, theta. So how does it affect the flux? Well, the flux is a negative number now. So whether B is increasing or decreasing, doesn't matter. Flux is here a negative number just because the A is pointing downward. Okay, so if the A is pointing downward, what about the cases here? Number one, B can be increasing. Okay, if B is increasing, the flux in magnitude getting bigger because you're multiplying the area by a larger number or integrating doesn't matter but it's negative it's becoming more negative okay if a number is getting more negative it is actually decreasing so d phi over dt is a negative number if this is negative that makes emf positive. Now what if magnetic field is decreasing you know in magnitude the flux is also getting smaller but it was a negative number so a negative number is actually increasing to have a, a smaller magnitude if you will smaller absolute value let's use the word absolute value a negative number has to increase so d phi by dt is a positive number when when b increases decreases i'm sorry therefore the emf is a negative number now let's find the direction of emf again starting with the increasing magnetic field okay i need a positive emf so whatever i find from the right hand rule is the direction of emf thumb pointing downward because that has to be the direction of da and the fingers curl this way so this is the direction of the emf which is a positive number but that corresponds to a an increasing magnetic field now the other one is a negative so change the direction you would find from right and roll and that would be this that's for decreasing magnetic field now compare this picture to the one on the left now apart from the sign of the emf Right? apart from the sign of the EMF the direction is the same so when the uh, magnetic field is increasing EMF is this way although negative it is this way in this case it's still the same way but it's just positive okay so calling EMF positive or negative doesn't really tell you unless you know doesn't tell you what direction the current will flow un unless you uh, tell uh, what your DA, where your DA is pointing at. Okay, so always go with the direction of EMF to find the direction of current. That's the physical thing you can measure. You can pick your DA anyway. It's not going to change the result. Same thing for uh, a decreasing B, decreasing magnetic field. When DA is pointing down, creates a negative EMF, but it's pointing this way. And that direction did not change when I was considering DA upward. The only thing that changed was a positive uh, sign for EMF, but we don't care about the sign of EMF. We care about the direction of EMF, if you will. Okay, so that is um, how you determine the direction of the EMF, and the uh, we'll see uh, later that this also has this interpretation. Let me actually give it right away. Um, so, if the magnetic field 
through our loop here is increasing uh, the flux let's say I use the example on the left here the flux is increasing as well okay so this loop will do something in order to resist or oppose that change okay the change is in this loop magnetic field is increasing the flux is increasing in order to oppose that change the current the, the the loop here will create a current an induced current we call which will oppose this change so if you had an induced magnetic field in the opposite direction okay the field which is up is increasing but you want to oppose that change so you create a field which is downward and a downward magnetic field which I'm going to call the induced field can only be generated by a current this way using the right hand rule again so that would give me a current which is shown in this direction okay so a ring a conducting ring and you have a magnetic field but the magnetic field is increasing in order to oppose that increase now I need to create a field myself that is the induced field and that can only be generated by a current in this loop which would flow in this direction I'm gonna call it the induced current okay so the induced current has a direction which is the same as the EMF's direction okay the direction of EMF and the direction of the induced current are the same so that's what uh, lens actually that's how we interpret this that's why we call it lens law okay um, if these pictures uh, didn't satisfy you let's look at this loop from a different angle let's say we look at this from top okay so top view if you look from above the magnetic field is coming out of the page so a dot in a circle this is the magnetic field right so my loop now use green is right there all right so I'm gonna draw this one more time here so this is the magnetic field which is coming out of the page and here's the loop why did I draw it twice because I want to pick uh, two directions for A in the first case A or DA is also coming out of the page in this one I'm gonna take DA to point going into the page All right so <clears throat> if the uh, field is increasing the field is increasing what will happen okay so let's use uh, the reasoning to where the reasoning we use when to when uh, we calculate the direction of the uh, EMF so for uh, the loop on the left where DA is coming out Phi is positive if P increases then uh, phi increases as well therefore EMF is negative so put your thumb in the direction of DA that's coming out of you out of the page towards you and a counterclockwise direction would be the direction of EMF but it's negative so we pick a direction in the opposite direction which is clockwise that's the EMF and 
that would mean a current in that direction, the induced current. So that induced current would create a magnetic field, an induced field, into the page. And that's what you would expect, because you want to oppose the change. If the field coming out of the page, you need a field going into the page, so that two vectors are in the opposite direction. Okay, so this direction of the induced field, induced magnetic field and induced current should not change just because I pick my dA different now. Now if dA is pointing in, a positive EMF would be clockwise. But do I have a positive EMF? Let's check that. Now the flux is a negative number because of the difference in the directions of the uh, B and DA. So if B is increasing, this means the flux is getting more negative. So D phi by DT is a negative number. Therefore, EMF is positive. So I put my thumb in the direction of DA and then clockwise. Please you do it yourself, okay? When you watch the video, put your thumb in the direction of DA into the page and then curl your fingers clockwise. This will be the direction of the positive EMF, which is positive in our case. Therefore, it is the direction of the induced current, and therefore the induced magnetic field is also into the page. Okay, so the physical observables, like the magnetic field and the current, did not change direction just because you changed your DA. Okay, so I guess, uh, I, I hope this helped you to see it better by changing the view from top view. It looks like this. So, we can change the uh, magnetic field strength and it's going to create an EMF. Is that the only way to change the flux? No, we could keep the magnetic field a constant, but change the, um, the angle between the vectors dA and B, all right? So let's design an experiment. Um, let's use a loop like this, a rectangular loop. Okay, a rectangular loop and the magnetic field may be parallel All right, now I'm gonna, of course, the angle right now is 90 degrees. So 90 degrees means cosine is zero. Nine degrees, right, this is dA. The Therefore, the flux is zero right now. is 90 degrees so I'm gonna change the angle how by rotating this loop I'm gonna assume there is now a an axis here which I can perform a rotation like that right like this so it's gonna move this side will come here going to rotate like this okay that will definitely change the angle so I will have uh, my flux changed pretty much it was zero it's now not zero a positive number so the flux increased there should be a negative EMF so this is uh, a 3d picture if you have trouble visualizing it let me draw the side view let's say what if I look at this picture from here Okay, so what I will see is a magnetic field to the right, 
Okay, and then this is your loop in the initial position. Now it's turned like this. Okay, so the A was pointing up. Now the A is pointing this way. Here, flux was zero. Now flux is a positive number. So this chain should create um, an EMF. All right. So if flux is increasing, d phi by dt is greater than zero. This means the EMF is a negative number. Okay. So, <clears throat> the direction of the EMF. Let's find the direction of the EMF. Okay, so at this instant, the DA points this way, right? So that would mean a positive EMF would be like this, so I have to revert it. This would be the direction of EMF. Okay. So this is the basis of uh, electric motors and electric generators. So can we produce electricity this way? Yes, that's actually how it's done. So let's take this loop and try to build something more realistic uh, out of it. We're going to call it the alternator, like the alternator in your car. Okay, so here's that uh, loop. Okay, I need a physical connection here, right? Otherwise, how am I gonna use the electricity? So I'm gonna take this. All right, and then this is my loop. I'm gonna use uh, a ring here which is slightly bigger than this dimension here. And I'm gonna use a similar uh, ring on this side. Okay, those rings are attached to the wires. Oops. And I'm gonna use brushes that will touch those rings from here. If I take those ends, leads, and then try to measure the potential difference, okay? Call them points A and B. I could connect them with a ammeter or resistor combination, okay? But that's the setup. So in this setup, uh, the rotation axis is the same in the middle. Okay, I'm going to rotate this like that. And the magnetic field is initially, let's say, I'm not touching the magnetic field. Magnetic field is always the same direction. I'm rotating the loop, right? So this is the alternator model. So let's look at the side view again, which will show what's happening here more clear hopefully so that's the magnetic field direction and uh, the yellow line here represents the position of the loop okay side view so this 
one on the uh, right is A, one on the left is B. So let's keep a track of which side we're talking about, right? So this is going to rotate now. Become vertical. And then like that. And flat again. But what happened? This side B was on the top, right? B is B. And now you have it here. So the other side is A, of course. A, A, A. We don't stop there, we keep it. We keep the rotation. Let's, let me just draw a full rotation at least. So I will have the snapshots you now uh, of this rotation. I can draw everything, just a few, a couple of those. Okay, so now A is on the top. A is here. So we're back to the same position, okay? So this repeats after that. These are the points B down. So our um, surface normal, let's say points up. Now it's pointing down, pointing this way. And up again. All right. So, a uh, couple of observations. Let's find the uh, sine of phi first for these cases. Now, obviously, when the angle is 90 degrees, phi is zero. Here, zero. But in these uh, three instances, you have a positive flux. Here, though, you have a negative because cosine theta will be negative, right? So let me turn this music down a little bit. Just give me a second. What about the change in phi? What about the change in phi? So is it positive or negative? D phi by dt. Now, the change from here to, obviously at this instant, it's about to rotate, right? So you have the maximum change actually, and uh, it's increasing. So it's a positive number. So is this one until it reaches the maximum flux. So this position here corresponds to maximum flux. But after that, it's gonna decrease. So that at that instant, the change in phi is simply zero. And after that becomes a decrease. Decrease, decrease until it is uh, zero again, and it's going to start increasing after that. All right. So this makes the sign of EMF negative, negative, zero, positive, 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 zero, negative, and negative. Right. So let's try to plot this, actually. Now, if you have a um, constant rotation rate, which we call the uh, rotational velocity or angular uh, velocity, omega, right? That's the direction. So omega is a vector, if you remember from your mechanics class. Omega is a vector, which you can use your right and roll as well. So, if, if it's a constant angular uh, velocity, omega uh, increases linearly, right? Omega increase, I'm sorry, uh, theta, well, I use theta for the angle. Well, the angle increases uh, linearly, but omega is a constant uh, function. So, what is it then? 
uh, how can I write uh, phi so let's plot okay I'm gonna move it to the left so you can see it all right so let this be the time axis and I'm gonna first try the magnetic flux now <clears throat> right here the flux is zero right it is zero here as well it's zero over there as well and between these two we have positive numbers all right so it's going to increase and decrease but it's going to remain positive and in this region here between these two zeros it's going to be a negative number that's our flux okay it's actually a, uh, a sine function right a sine function now why do we have sine when you have rotation uh, you can describe the uh, the the rotational variable rotational position as a trigonometric function right sine or cosine depending on when you start your stopwatch so this fits that description well phi changes as a sinusoidal function based on this time so on the same plot i can uh, show you the emf right let's use a different color let's use a uh, light blue for emf now the places where emf is zero will be here and over there right in the middle again and in between those the emf will be a positive number and then here negative and here also negative right so and the greatest slope uh, for uh, change in phi is when we have um, the greatest slope for phi is in the beginning right there and it's zero over there and uh, the negative slope here okay so the slope means this and the negative of that number times minus one gives you the emf right so this picture <coughs> would look the same if you picked um, the uh, the a vector the other way around it will be just shifted okay remember it repeats itself so these are periodic functions right so if you pick a, a da which points downward you can do the same analysis and you'll find out that you'll have a similar picture only shifted uh half a period okay uh what if it would what if it was turning the other way around If it was turning the other way around you can do a similar analysis and uh, if you do that you will have an EMF like this if the rotation is the other way which would be uh, counterclockwise counterclockwise okay here we're talking about a clockwise rotation so that would be the difference so that's the uh, alternator that's how you uh, charge your battery in your, in your car when the uh, engine runs it turns the alternator therefore provides the current necessary to charge your battery and of course your battery is a DC battery you cannot charge a battery with 
a DC current. I'm sorry, an AC current. An alternator, pro alternator produces an AC current. So what do we need then? We need either we, uh, well, we cannot replace the alternator with something else in your car. So you have to rectify it uh, using some electronic equipment and turn the AC into DC. Uh, or you could use a DC generator to create uh, DC currents. Here's how you do it. You start with the same loop. Okay, but uh, you change it here. Instead of this, uh, these two rings, you can use two semi rings. like these remember these are supposed to rotate right but your brushes will have to touch the two so let's name these uh, a and b again okay the one on the left was called uh, B. Now we're gonna call this one A, right? So I'm not sure if you can see what's happening here. Maybe I should draw it bigger. So a semicircle here is what we have. Semi ring like this. All right. So the brushes are here. The better picture is in your book. All right. So as this rotates. What happens? The side of the loop, which was B, will become an A, and then A become will become B. All right. So that's the difference. So in our picture here, okay, we'll have to switch. The switch will happen according to this picture here when uh, you have the uh, loop up in the uh, perpendicular direction. So whenever you have the loop like this, the switch will occur between those two points, A and B. So if you come here, these are the instances where the switch will happen, okay? Right there and right here. Okay, so let's say it happened right there, which means B became A, and A became B, B, A, and also here it will become B and A, and after that, same, A, A, B, B, okay? So this means that um, the sign of the uh, EMF will remain the same throughout the cycle. That's what it means. So it looks like uh, in this picture here, I have two negatives, your negative there. These will be replaced by negatives, but you can think of it uh, both be, become positive too. I mean, it just depends on how you name these A and Bs, right? So the result is this then. Okay, uh, what color should I use? Let's use uh, green. Okay, so this could be your new EMF. Okay, positive or negative, doesn't matter. It depends on how you name your A and B. So you could have uh, this. Or Uh, actually, I made a mistake here. Let me just correct this left one here. Okay. This is called the back EMF. Okay, like that. Or like that. But the important thing is it's not alternating. It is not alternating. Not alternating. 
back EMF. It's called back EMF. Okay, so always the same signs, and you can uh, improve this and obtain a DC current, and you can charge your battery this way. It's a DC generator. Okay, so this will be the DC generator by adding these um, semi rings with brushes. Okay, of course, brushes will uh, introduce friction and you will lose energy. That's why uh, Tesla, Nikola Tesla, came up with electric generators or motors who don't need brushes, okay? Induction motors. He called them induction motors. Okay, I'm gonna leave that to you to look it up, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a very ingenious um, method of a way of uh, building better uh, electric motors, okay? So every generator, it's like a motor, you know, if in the, in the case of electric motor, you provide the current and obtain rotation, you know, um, but if you rotate it, you get electricity. It works the other both ways. So that's based on electromagnetic induction. So we can change the magnetic field, keep the area constant, you have induction. Or you can change, you can keep the magnetic field constant, but change the orientation of the loop that will also create an EMF therefore a current um, as it is in the case of the DC uh, generator the direction of the current will remain the same its magnitude will uh, go in between minimum I mean uh, zero and maximum but direction wise it's going to be the same or alternator uh, alternating generator the direction will change as well um, that's another way of creating induction here's another method uh, use a u-shaped wire conducting wire and then a piece of metal which is gonna slide on top of it okay and the magnetic field is let's say up okay I mean this magnetic field uh, may vary or not doesn't matter really because we're gonna move the piece here we're gonna move this so we're gonna have a velocity here to the right so what what why do we need this by moving that rod on the rail we're effectively changing the area okay it's not the angle that is changing or it's not the uh, time dependence of the magnetic field it's just the area is getting bigger all right so the area is getting bigger therefore phi changes now if uh, you pick a da which is also up that change is positive d phi by dt is increasing because area is increasing so let's define the area let this coordinate be x X is changing. This is the X direction. In the Y direction, this is a constant length. Call it L. All right. So assume a uniform B for just easy. Assume a uniform magnetic field. Then flux in this area. All right is simply B times the area or B times area area of a rectangle L times X 
And then you need the derivative of that. d5 by dt bl dx. x is changing with time, and by definition, that is v. Right? v is dx by dt bl v. So the magnitude of our EMF will be BLV. Uh, let's find the direction. So E is negative BLV. Okay, so there will be a current in this loop here. By loop, I mean the left side of this bar, right? So let's find it using uh, both arguments, meaning first use the right hand rule where you Put your thumb in the direction of the area vector all right and decide whether it's going to be uh, counterclockwise looking from top or clockwise okay well to find that of course you need to know the uh, value of e well it looks like e is going to be a negative number so that tells E to be this way, but let's confirm it using the physical argument, which is the changes in the area should be compensated with induced currents or induced uh, magnetic fields caused by induced currents. So the flux is increasing. In order to oppose that change, I need a downward field. An induced field if you will induced magnetic field which will be pointing downward that's B induced and for a loop to current the induced field downward the current induced current should be indeed the same direction as the EMF so this is the direction of the induced current Okay, so the EMF is also in the same direction. So that is another uh, way to create electromagnetic induction. The two generators and this uh, slide wire generator. That's what it's called, a slide wire. Slide wire generator this one was called DC generator and this is simply called an alternator okay so going back to this slide wire generator okay that's EMF let's calculate um, let's consider let's let's uh, consider what happens to energy or energy uh, per time right power the energy dissipation now in this system we have a certain resistance right so this resistance will be related to the EMF through this so the EMF will create a current therefore we have I which is E over R right so you can uh, take this and divide by R this will be the current now if you take the square of that and multiply by R this means power dissipated in the circuit. So B L B squared L squared V squared over R squared times R. So we have B squared L squared V squared divided by R. This is power dissipated. All right, so. Now, 
there's another way of uh, looking at power. Power can be written as uh, the dot product of uh, force and instantaneous velocity. Hopefully you remember that from uh, University Physics 1. Right? So, uh, power is also written as F dot V. So what force are we talking about here, right? What force are we talking about here? Well, we have a current in a magnetic field, which will experience a force. So that force will be considering the length here is L the direction perpendicular to the uh, velocity. So that current, I, times that length, times the magnetic field, this will be the force, ILB. And if I multiply it by V, I get power. So plug in I here, BLV over R times LBV, you get the same number b squared l squared v squared over r okay that's the slide wire generator okay so i mentioned um creating emf with a magnet let's try that let's pick a loop a wire in this shape Elliptical, all right. So initially there's nothing here and I'm gonna take a magnet and hold the magnet right there. Will anything happen with the north and south poles? Well, this will definitely create a magnetic field. Uh, the direction is from north to south outside the magnet. course these are loops they go back to the uh, magnet right and inside the magnet from south to north but if I just hold it there I'm not changing the flux in any way I'm not rotating this I'm not moving the magnet I have to move the magnet to create a flux so why don't I just drop the magnet okay so the magnet is actually moving downward now the flux changes okay so how do i find the flux i pick a uh, da it could be up or down doesn't matter let's pick up this is the area vector or da depending on which one okay da is pointing up but the field is pointing downward therefore the flux is a negative number, but as the magnet approaches the loop, practically your flux is getting bigger magnitude-wise because magnetic field lines are denser close to the pole, okay, and the pole is approaching your thing. But flux is negative, so your flux is getting more negative. Okay, I mean, uh, d phi by dt is a negative number, which will create a positive EMF. So, put your thumb in the direction of dA or A and curl your fingers for a positive EMF. That is the direction of the EMF. Okay, so we're, we're kind of looking at the loop from top, not from below. I mean, sometimes these pictures can be seen both ways. So we're looking at the, uh, the loop from above. Not like this, but like with an angle, but above, not below, okay? So that's the direction of EMF. Now let's confirm this using uh, the physical approach, the lens approach, right? Approach, uh, the field which is downward, 
is getting bigger. In order to oppose that change, I need a field which is up. That is the induced field. And that can only be generated by a current which is in that direction where EMF is. So let's just use green for that. So this will be the direction of the induced magnetic field, which can only be created by a current this way. That's the induced current. All right, so that's gonna, that's what's gonna happen until the magnet passes through it. But what happens after that? So let's look at a fraction of a second later. Here's your loop. The magnet now is right here. South and North Poles with the uh, field lines like this. Remember, magnetic field lines are always loops. I'm not drawing the whole picture, okay? They're gonna complete. I can't draw all the things, but everything but here this should be enough right but this part is what i'm interested in so the field which is downward is getting weaker where the loop is i'm not going to change the direction of da uh, phi is still negative but now it's getting weaker, which means it's going to get close to zero. That can happen if the flux is increasing, numerically speaking, right? Magnitude-wise, it's actually decreasing, but numerically, it is getting closer to zero from a negative number. It's becoming less negative, therefore, that derivative is positive, which makes the EMF... A negative number All right EMF is negative let's plot these let's plot these uh, oh sorry let me find the direction of the EMF now so if uh, EMF is negative this means the direction can be found by putting your thumb in direction of DA but whatever direction your fingers are pointing, the other fingers, four fingers, pick the other direction. So this will be the direction of the EMF. Or use the arguments, physical arguments. The field which is pointing downward is getting weaker, okay? And loop doesn't like changes. It wants to oppose change. So it adds more field into it. That more field is the induced field, right? So the uh, induced field is going to be pointing downward. And a downward induced field can only be generated by a current this way. So this will be the direction of the induced current. Okay, so let's plot these. Uh, let's try to plot uh, both phi and uh, EMF. As functions of time. Let's start with the magnetic flux. As a function of time. Now, when the magnet is far away, the flux is small, okay? It's negative, but small. So you're somewhere here, a small negative number. And then as the magnet approaches the loop, it's going to become more negative like this. Pretty much when the uh, magnet is inside the loop, right in the middle, you've reached your maximum uh, flux because that's where, that's when the uh, field is maximum. Okay, so for a while, 
it's going to stay there as maximum and then quickly go back to zero now this picture will not have the right and left symmetry the reason is as magnet falls under gravity it speeds up so the velocity here v prime is greater than the v in the beginning so it's speeding up that's why this picture here doesn't have a ref left right symmetry okay so everything in the second phase is happening quick quicker than the first phase uh, okay that's flux what about the emf now the emf is positive first and then negative right so for emf we have uh, something like this first positive and then negative okay In this picture I'm not sure if I any accurate it's a sketch just a sketch right so this will be your uh, EMF and uh, this is a negative EMF this is positive of course and here it's going to be more negative more negative than this number positive the reason is uh, BLV remember so there is a relationship between uh, the velocity here EMF is proportional to the velocity so if V is greater it's going to be a um, greater number there okay so more sp spiky okay so that's the uh, magnet falling uh, through a loop now this is something so easy I mean you can do it in a lab I wish I had the chance to show it to you uh, you just take a um, piece of magnet a loop and connect the loop to a um, an oscilloscope or a computer uh, with some um, voltage detector connected to it you would obtain these graphs easily um, so these experiments can be done and always you will see this type of course if you change the polarity of the of the thing you will have different results uh, the point is though you will always have positive and negative parts for the uh, EMF is it possible to have only one meaning a hypothetical situation you start with a loop excuse me you start with a loop and something passes through this and you obtain an EMF that look like this is never possible like if if it was possible to isolate the North Pole remember we called this monopole before north south doesn't matter but if, if a magnetic charge they don't exist but if they did this is how you take them why now if this existed then the magnetic field lines would be going out of the radially outward okay hypothetical this doesn't exist does not exist as far as we know but it doesn't keep us from you know theorizing right so if this particle which is a single pole south or north doesn't matter in this case it's north if it's falling through that loop what would happen now based on this picture yes we would have an EMF but when the thing leaves the field lines are still pointing away oops I said away but I just drew the wrong way okay 
like this. So as the particle passes through the loop, the direction of the magnetic field suddenly changes. All right. So the flux was negative when the particle was on the top. As soon as it passed, the flux became now, uh, the magnetic field became up. It was downward, now it is up. So that will create a change in the sign of phi as well. Okay, phi will not be like this one over here. As a result, um, the uh, induced uh, magnetic field, which is still up when the uh, particle approaches the ring. As the particle leaves the ring, the field, which is now up, is decreasing. In order to compensate for that decrease, induced field should still be up. If that's the case, the induced current will have only one direction. Therefore, the EMF will only be in this direction, always positive. So if you ever observe this, you'll, you will win the Nobel Prize, guaranteed. Okay, but you, nobody has uh, done it so far. So this would be the proof for the existence of monopoles. All right. So, motional EMF. Now, how about this? Remember the example here with the, uh, what did we call it? The slide, slide wire generator. Let's drop the uh, U-shaped wire. Let's just work with that bar moving in a magnetic field. And I'm gonna try to look at this problem from the top view. So this is called uh, motional EMF. Motional EMF. And the example that I'm going to consider is the one in the book, which is just a straight bar, but it's moving in a magnetic field. So in this case, magnetic field, let me look at that example again. It was uh, pointing up. Okay, so in this top view, it's going to be coming out of the page. So the magnetic field is coming out of the page. Also here. Okay, but the object is moving to the right. Now think in terms of the uh, free electrons which are responsible for currents, remember? What will happen to those charges, those electrons? Now, electron is a negative charge, but now it has a velocity, so it has to feel a force, which is given by Q, V cross B. This is the magnetic force on a moving charge. So the direction of V cross B is found using the right hand rule. Put your thumb in the direction of the velocity, which is to the right, and B is coming out of the monitor or paper. So downward is the direction of the cross product. But since Q is negative, these are electrons. So V cross B is downward, minus that downward becomes upward. So the force on the electron, the force on the electron is up. Okay, let's do one more time. Put your thumb in the direction of V to the right, and index finger in the direction of B coming out of the page. So the cross product is downward. You flip it to find the direction of the force, which is up. So the electrons move up. Okay, they accumulate here, making this side negative. Which means the other side will be positive. Right? So what do we have when you have positive charges and negative charges? 
what do you have in between? Electric field, right? So we will have an electric field. Let's use, uh, what color is this? Blue pen. Not blue, let's use uh, red to show the electric field. Which is up. All right, that's the electric field. Whenever you have an electric field, it will exert a force on the charge as well. So the electric field will result in a force. But remember, Q is negative. It's an electron. So this force is actually pointing downward. Okay, so you have the electron here, it's pulled up by the magnetic force, pulled downward by the, what, electric force. And this electric force increases as more and more charges accumulate at the uh, edges or the ends of the bar to a point until uh, Fe becomes equal to Fb. If they become equal, they don't move anymore. They do their own thing, but they will not move up or down, okay? Up, basically. So when there are enough charges, enough charges, electrons, meaning on the top, these two will be equal to each other. Fe will be F equal to Fb. That's the equilibrium state. Equilibrium, okay, but in the equilibrium state you will still have the charges at the at the ends, but not more than a certain number, okay. Unless you change the speed. If you increase the speed, the force will magnetic force will increase, and then electric field force will compensate for that. But for a given fixed velocity, uh, you'll reach equilibrium real quick. When you do that, the two forces will be equal to each other. So Q times E will be equal to Q V B. I mean this equation sine 90 is 1 so it's just uh, sine 90 is 1 therefore it is just Q V B so Q's cancel so what do we find e equals V B all right remember the length of this was L length of the bar was L so um, electric field can be written as EMF divided by that distance because EMF would be the electric field times distance right so E over L is equal to VB or E is equal to LVB okay actually the other one was negative right so I could say just the uh, magnitude of it here BLV so we get the same result BLV so that's uh, even when you don't have a loop um, this motion creates EMF and we call it motional EMF All right the conductor has to move in a magnetic field to create this motional EMF now what if we use um, not a straight wire but some arbitrary shape okay so some arbitrary shape and some magnetic field arbitrary now b doesn't have to be uniform b may change in distance and the shape like this so can we come up with an expression you know something like this or a general expression which will give us the uh, the emf for the situation yes since it's a loop you know we can define an infinitesimal uh, displacement along the loop dl 
Okay, so here DL, just like the Ampere's law, same way you can define a DL. All right, so you can write the motional EMF, motional EMF as a line integral of, now uh, we have to move this around, right? So there has to be a velocity here. And uh, you can move different parts of the loop with different velocities. If it's a long cable, right, a cable like this, you make a loop out of it, and then you're pulling it. As you're pulling it, you may be deforming it, which means different parts will move with different speeds, you know. So who knows? I mean, we're really looking after really uh, general results here. So we're going to take that uh, V and take the cross product of that with the magnetic field so it's still a vector but take the dot product of that vector with dl that we have here two vectors multiplied but dot product scalar product so this will be a scalar again okay so that is our uh, motional EMF, the general expression for motional EMF. If you wish, uh, you add, uh, let me erase the scalar here. You know, it's a scalar, right? I mean, it's a scalar product. Let's just write here equals EMF, which is by definition d phi over dt. So that is our motional EMF. Faraday, Faraday disk dynamo. Okay, so this example can be generalized. Okay, there are two ways of doing it. You can take this bar and start spinning it like this instead of moving in that magnetic field. It's still in motion, right? Or you could start with a plate and rotate it inside a magnetic field. That's what uh, the book chooses. It's called the Faraday Disk Dynamo. Well, there are historical reasons because that's the actual uh, de device he built, right? So here's the uh, A conducting disk. All right. A conducting disk like this. So, uh, radius R let's say and there's a mid middle section here maybe another cylinder cylindrical shape a rotor and around that you have the spinning okay so Omega angular velocity which is spinning like this Rotation, okay? Rotation. So if that happens, and um, to make, it's called a dynamo, Faraday's dynamo, Faraday's dynamo, dynamo, like a generator, right? So you need brushes so that you can connect a, a brush here. Another brush and see if there's any current. Okay, that's the idea. So, what happens? Uh, the magnetic field, of course, there has to be a magnetic field, otherwise, this will not work. So, which way the magnetic field do you want? Up? Let's pick it up. Okay. Okay, so. You can use the same arguments like the electrons moving and all that, right? I mean, uh, the electron um, right here. As the disk rotates, the electron has a tangential or linear speed in that direction as well. So that would be this direction, V. So V is pointing this way, and there's a magnetic field up. The cross product V cross B is radially outward, which means 
the force is radially inward. This is the direction of the force. Okay, so the electrons are moving here, which will make this side positive. So you're going to end up with a, uh, a current. Now the current is going to go from, okay, so it's the other direction. This is the direction of the current. Okay, the electrons are moving this way. The opposite direction is the current. A dynamo. You can't create a lot of current here. It's a very small current, but it is there. But let's um, find, let's apply this uh, formula here, this one. Okay, so V cross B dot DL. Now I'm gonna, okay, it is a um, loop integral, but uh, the magnetic field is only here. I don't really care about what's happening out there, right, other places. So it just turns out to be a, a um, an integral from, let's say, the center to the outer, the perimeter. So, because all other integrals are, all other terms are zero. Okay, so this, uh, is equal to from 0 to R let's say plus everything else but everything else is going to be 0 because there's no magnetic field there okay I'm talking about the rest of the uh, circuit so V cross B I mean V is perpendicular to uh, B anyway so uh, sine 90 is 1 Therefore, VBDL, okay? So in the radial direction, uh, DL is nothing but DR in that radial outward direction, okay? So what about V? Well, V can be written in terms of the angular uh, velocity, omega times R. Of course, it depends on how far you're from the, uh, the, the the center, right? Closer you are to the perimeter, greater your tangential velocity. So it's omega times r. Omega is a constant, and b is a constant as well. So omega b r is left, and dl is dr, and you're integrating from zero to capital R. So one half omega b r squared. That is your EMF. Okay. That is the uh, voltage of the Faraday's uh, dynamo. Okay. So this brings us to the topic of induced electric fields. If uh, changing magnetic fields uh, if the change of the magnetic field is going to create uh, electric field does it mean what does it say about uh, the physical reality of those fields okay so can you imagine a, a case uh, where you don't have any magnetic field in that particular region but because of what's happening to the um, flux change nearby, we can obtain some uh, electric fields, okay? So these are called induced electric fields. Electric fields. Let's take a, an example of a, um, a solenoid, a coil. So, okay, so I'm going to need a, uh, a coil wrapped on this. So, 
This is why we have a magnetic field. Okay, I mean, it doesn't matter how many terms, but okay, let's say. Uh, let's say we connect a battery and then end up with a current. But I want to change the current, okay? A variable source. So this is how it works. This is the direction of the current. Now this current will of course create a magnetic field and we know how to find the uh, field generated by this uh, inside the coil. It's this direction, right? Magnetic field is to the left, and then it's gonna go like this. These are loops, of course. So this is the direction of the magnetic field, okay? Now, if this B changes, this means I will change in time, dI by dt, okay? Let's say it's increasing, for instance. So this will lead to a change in the flux. The flux through a loop you may choose. Let's do that. Let's pick a uh, ring around it. Okay, so the flux uh, in that area will change. Let's call this area here a is the area of the um, the coil okay the sol solenoid solenoid okay so the uh, EMF let's start with finding the magnetic field so do you remember this we use the Ampere's Ampere's law to find the uh, magnetic field inside a solenoid. Let's remember that. So you pick a, see the magnetic field here is really close to zero actually. Uh, we talked about this in the previous video, so I'm not gonna repeat that. The really uh, part that counts is the inside of the solenoid. So if you uh, pick a, an Amperian loop in the shape of a rectangle here of some arbitrary length, call it L for instance, the uh, Ampere's law, B dot DL, right? This is the uh, magnetic field calculated along a, a loop, a closed path. Integrated will be equal, equal to mu naught times uh, the current going through the surface that is enclosed by that loop, okay? So mu naught times I enclosed. That's Ampere's law. Ampere's law. Now, since the magnetic field is only inside the coil, this integral is simply B times L. And on the right hand side, we have mu naught, but this enclosed current is not I, because I goes through many times inside that Amperian loop. How many times? Well, we just need to multiply the length by the uh, density here, okay? I mean, how tight the uh, the, the wire is uh, uh, wound there, so it's a density, call it N. If you have a total number of uh, turns, for instance, you could divide by total length, L, that would be that little N, for instance. Okay, so mu naught times N, that many times the current enters that loop, so I'm going to multiply it by I. Therefore, uh, sorry, mu and there's an L here, right? L's cancel. And B becomes mu naught N I. So the flux then is B times A. So mu naught N I A. And then you need the uh, derivative of that. The only time dependent uh, function here is I. So you will have mu naught and A 
di by dt therefore the emf will be negative mu naught and a di by dt okay so that is your um, faraday's uh, induced emf now <clears throat> the thing though is remember the original loop here the the red line here there's no magnetic field there but there's still something pushing the electrons right otherwise you wouldn't have a current no emf so there's a physical truth you know to the reality of that electric field it's not just some uh, mathematical uh, thing so what is it that's the induced electric field and we're going to include that field in our uh, equation here so uh, we're going to take that electric field so remember how you define electric potential uh, you would uh, integrate electric field from point a to point b that would give you the potential difference in this case it's not points a and b because it's a closed loop but we can still integrate e okay so we're gonna consider a loop integral e dot dl and that will be the emf all right so this will be the emf which we call the induced emf and e is called the induced electric field okay so if there's emf that's because there is electric field or vice versa so uh, let's calculate that electric field for this problem here so this integral here let's say the uh, radius is r r then this integral becomes e times 2 pi r 2 pi r is the circumference so that's equal to this number here mu naught n a di by dt with a negative sign and you can solve it for e but basically e will be a reciprocal function of r right so um, negative mu naught and a over 2 pi r di by dt all right that's the induced electric field now what if uh, you consider a loop within the original solenoid something small like this that's when uh, r is less than uh, this big r well, it's called big r and here it is maybe equal or a little bit bigger than capital r okay so what happens then well if that's the case then uh, the left hand side is still the same e uh, times 2 pi r but the right hand side will need the flux and the flux is magnetic field times area but that area is not the area I used here this area was pi capital R squared in this case it'll be uh, little r squared so when you solve this for E this cancels uh, that it'll be proportional to R okay so that's the uh, induced electric field when R is less than capital R here R is close or maybe uh, let's say R is greater than or equal to let's say so that's induced electric field and uh, eddy currents are example of this let's say you have a magnet and then you have a plate that goes through the magnet if it's a conducting plate you will have currents in the form of loops okay so those are called eddy currents currents in the form of loops so 
let's finish this chapter with uh, displacement current and Maxwell's equation. Equations, there are four of them, and we've already discovered uh, most of them. Um, so what Maxwell did was actually he he was a theorist, okay, in the um, 19th century. He laid the foundations of electromagnetic theory, but uh, there was a term missing in the equations. So what are the equations we know so far? We have um, we have um, the Gauss's law, E dot dA close uh, equal to um, Q and closed divided by epsilon zero and we have uh, magnetic equivalence of this which is always zero and we have um, the uh, Ampere's law I'm going to leave it till the end here Ampere's law B dot DL which is mu at mu naught times I n closed, right? And then we have this uh, EMF, E dot DL, close to, yeah, equal to negative D phi. By the way, for a coil, uh, you multiply uh, the change in the EMF by n. I think I forgot to put it. Oh no, actually I did it here. But in general, an EMF for a coil, let's say you have uh, many turns and they have magnetic field through it, the EMF will be equal to negative n if it has n number of terms, d phi by dt. Okay, so you have this here. So Maxwell thought about okay if uh, if changing electric fields can create magnetic fields can we have electric field created by changing magnetic field so he added a term here he added a term okay that's one of his greatest uh, contributions to the theory of electromagnetism so it's a pure theoretical idea, mathematical idea. You know, it's a symmetric thing. So you gotta preserve the uh, symmetric um, nature of equations. And here's the reasoning, though. Uh, you know, capacitors, right? We already have capacitors, a parallel plate capacitor, let's say. They don't, look, they don't look parallel, do they? Okay, like this. Now, when you first connect this to a battery, you turn the switch on and charges start moving. So you start having positive charges here. Okay, this corresponds to a current, right? A current. Uh, conducting current that's what uh, they call it conduction current I'm sorry conduction current now let's uh, also consider that there will be the main electric field here between the plates right electric field now consider an Amperian loop, which will be here, an Amperian loop. And remember, Ampere's law states that if you calculate that integral, be that dl, that will give you uh, mu naught times the current passing through the surface that is enclosed by that loop. Yeah, I mean, we have that surface here, right? And there's a current through it. That's IC. That's fine. But is, is this then it? Is that the end of the story? 
Okay, that's the question. Now, what if someone comes up with another surface, which is like a balloon, but now it includes the charges also here? Okay, it's like a bag, like a uh, plastic bag. Okay, but the top is that loop, like a, a trash bag maybe, okay? But now it encloses the, uh, the charges there. Now, you don't see any current leaving the plate, right? It seems like a contradiction. So we have in, in one of the case where we only consider that area, the first area, the shaded area, there's a current there, the conduction current. But if you consider the surface, which is still bound by the same loop, but the surface encloses the, uh, the plate, the left plate, then there's no current, so there's a contradiction. So he fixed it with this idea here. He introduced a um, current called uh, displacement current, ID. Displacement current. Okay, let's try to find what that should be equal to. Now the charge here, let's call it Q is equal to capacitance times some voltage, right? And the voltage <coughs> could be written in terms of uh, the, uh, the electric field. So C times electric field times uh, the separation here, right? Between the two, D. But the capacitance can also be written the same way, so meaning A times epsilon zero over D times E, D. So the D's cancel. So the charge is equal to A epsilon zero E. Okay? So if you take the derivative of that, DQ by DT, Uh, that is a epsilon zero de by dt okay but what is a a is area so a times e is a flux so what we really are saying here is e naught epsilon naught times d flux but electric flux over dt right so we're going to call this quantity which has the units of coulombs per second, we're gonna call it the displacement current. So this enclosed current is not just the conduction current, but also the displacement current. So that's what uh, he did. He placed that term here next to mu naught I enclosed. And that term will be the um, displacement current term in other words this so you will have mu naught oops the new term here let's use red again mu naught epsilon naught d phi by dt okay that's Maxwell's contribution and uh, we have four equations, okay? Maxwell's four equations. So let's box these and later we're gonna find out that electromagnetic waves can be found directly from these equations, oops. So light is an electromagnetic wave. So these are actually the equations of light. So Maxwell's equations. All right, so that finishes this chapter. Um, 
you know what the equations are, the other ones. The first one is Gauss's law. Second one is the Gauss's laws equivalent or uh, in magnetism, but there are no magnetic monopoles. So this tells you that. This is Gauss's law. This means there are no monopoles. This is induction, and then you have the uh, generalized Ampere's law. Generalized Ampere's law. All right, so that's the end of uh, this chapter. And from now on, we're going to focus on the uh, the the induction uh, properties of uh, coils and things like that inductance then that's going to take us to ac circuits okay so pretty much uh, one two three more chapters that i want to cover in these videos next chapter will be inductance and then we have AC circuits and then electromagnetic fields. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording now. Till next time, goodbye.